are you doing? It's Charlie for Digital Gramophone. He said he wants contributions from VC members. Not that kind of contribution from that kind of member. It's John of a digital gramophone. You know, the top 200 of this, the top billion of that, the top zillion of the other. Oh, he wants to show some records. Yes. Oh, uh, the top three to five best albums. Wow. We haven't really got any favourites, have we? Oh, uh, no. Let's just humour him. Oh, uh, yeah, OK. How long did he give us? Well, he rather generously said, one minute thirty seconds. Well, wow, that is generous. Thanks, John. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, how much longer we got left? Oh, uh, thirty-five seconds. Uh, Al, we're going to need your help. Yeah, Al. OK, guys, here's some records you like listening to earlier. Oh, yeah, that's a VC. How low can it go? Well, I say, it's hit rock bottom. It really has. Oh, dear. Oh, yeah, and there's another one. We always say, you have to be on acid to enjoy the VC. Yeah, you really do. I just say, ram it up its own ass. Oh, yeah, just ram the VC up its ass. Yeah. At number 20, I have Anodyne by Uncle Tupelo from 1993. So where did I get to Uncle Tupelo? I guess I was uh, 15, around 15 years old, and I actually bought this compilation, No Alternative, which is a excellent, excellent like alternative compilation from 1993. Right there, you'll see it. Uncle Tupelo, Effigy, cover of the Credence Clearwater Revival song. I just love that song. Uh, I loved a lot of songs off this, this compilation and it would introduce me to a lot of bands, bands that I already knew as well, but that one was a game changer. Sometime after that, very soon after that, I was uh, out of town with my family. We were in Durham, North Carolina, and we were just up there uh, visiting my uncle who lived close by and we decided to drive down to the Duke University campus and just kind of walk around and there was a record store close by and I saw it and I asked my dad do you mind if I you know go inside and look around I was very aware that I was on a college campus so you know that pressure that you put on yourself when you're uh, out of town um, going into a record store you've never been into and you want to buy something uh, different and you want to buy something that, you know, is not going to get a, a sneer from the clerk behind the counter. And I, I found this album and I took it up to the counter and bought it. And um, it was uh, a very welcome purchase, which made me feel good <laughs> as a, uh, a very um, unconfident teen. So Uncle Tupelo is my all-time favorite band, and I say that because of how much this album changed my life and the music that I would grow into loving as I got older. It was my gateway to Graham Parsons, it was my gateway to Doug Somm, it was my gateway to older country music. This is Uncle Tupelo's last album. They were signed to Sire Records. Uh, Mike Heidorn, the original drummer, was gone. They brought on some new members that eventually, once the band broke up, would go with Jeff Tweedy to form Wilco. And you can really hear uh, Farrar and Tweedy's paths diverging on this record. Uh, Jeff is just becoming a better and better songwriter, where Jay Farrar was really the stronger between the two on the first three records. Uh, Jeff really comes into his own on this album, and he's really starting to kind of to find his groove and, and he's really starting to develop that more kind of country rock ode to kind of classic rock sound that he would uh, develop even, even further on the first two Wilco records. And Jay was really starting to become a tried and true country singer uh, with songs like the title track and High Water especially. But yeah, this album is just incredibly important to me changed my life, literally changed my life. Salute.
solutions we're after and avert our chronic impending disaster. Chickamauga. At number 19, I have Revolver by The Beatles from 1966. This is my second Beatles album on the list. And as I mentioned earlier, I didn't really grow up with The Beatles the way a lot of my peers grew up with The Beatles. My mom listened to The Beatles and she loved The Beatles when she was, when she was young, when she was a teenager. As she <laughs> once said to me, she loved The Beatles before they changed. <laughs> so I just heard pretty much volume one of the two volume greatest hits set. That's pretty much what I grew up with with the Beatles. I didn't really dive into their their better works, their best albums, you know, their latter half of their career until I was, uh, I mean, I was in high school, but I was starting to graduate and I was moving into college. In the interviews over the years, the members of the band have, have said that they pretty much considered Rubber Soul and Revolver to be almost volume one and volume two. But the experimentation on Revolver is light years ahead of what was happening on Rubber Soul. You know, the, the studio experimentation was just off the charts at this point. I don't feel like at any point in their discography that Harrison and McCartney and Lennon were working as a unit better than they were on this album. Harrison with Love You Too and I Want To Tell You and Lennon with I'm Only Sleeping and And Your Bird Can Sing. I mean, they're really, those two are really pushing their sonic palettes. And then McCartney's wide array of pop masterpieces like perfectly balances out that experimentation from the bouncy good day sunshine and got to get you into my life to just the absolutely devastating for no one. But of course it's, it's Eleanor Rigby, which is lacking any rock instrumentation at all. And then uh, John Lennon's tomorrow never knows. It's just a, a mad science experiment. Uh, I mean, those two songs, in my opinion, are really what changed popular music forever. At number 18, I have The Band by The Band from 1969. The band I wouldn't get into until I was kind of that period of my life where I was revisiting kind of classic rock legends and um, I started with music from Big Pink. And even though I started with music from Big Pink, as I think most people do, and, and, I, and I absolutely love that album, it's this album that I, that I truly associate as the as the band's sound it's the very rustic feel of the album you know rustic with kind of folk and country rock leanings but also still very rooted in r&b like in songs like jemima surrender and king harvest which really come there is the very epic the night they drove old dixie down and i could do a whole video on how that mu how that song translates to today and my feelings on it, but it's still an amazing example of composition. However, the, the true magic lies in the quieter moments on this record, the very nostalgic when you awake, uh, the, just the serene unfaithful servant and whispering pines, all of the vocal performances by Helm and Manuel and Danko are just amazing amazing and this album is really important to me because it's it's such a bedrock a, a foundation for so much of the americana music that i love today at number 17 i have sign of the times by prince from 1987 as an adolescent and a young teen i'll be completely honest prince's music just kind of made me blush i don't think that i was ready um, probably still not <laughs> for that amount of just intense sexuality. But once I did really dive into his albums, you know, of course it started with like his best of compilation and purple rain and in 1999. 
But when I got to Sign of the Times, that was when I truly, truly recognized his absolute genius. And it made me go back and hear the the previous albums that I was already familiar with with a completely different ear. It's an, an absolutely sprawling double album, much in the vein of the White Album, uh, except I will argue that there's not a single wasted moment on this one. He covers absolutely all ground of popular music. Uh, his usual fusion of pop and funk, but with even more creative prowess. There's a more direct take on soul in Slow Love, the heavily distorted guitar on, on the very just forward rock song, The Cross. And, you know, even though it has a very different feel to it, I feel like Adore is just as epic of a closer as Purple Rain. And then there's the title track, which I truly believe is one of the greatest songs ever written. It perfectly encapsulates the beginning of the end of a decade that more than celebrated excess and sets the stage for the 90s, which was a, a decade that would welcome in like an age of cynicism. And in that brilliant Prince way, after laying out a series of current events of apocalyptic measure, he sums it up with a solution of let's just get married and have a baby. I just think is brilliant. I mean, and who would have ever imagined Prince talking about marriage and kids? At number 16, I have John Prine by John Prine from 1971. So a good friend of mine, uh, Scott, he, he plays music, sings. He's played around in a few bands like over the years, and he still does, you know, bar gigs solo and things like that. In our younger years, there was a, we were up late. It was just like one of those late nights and, he had his guitar out and he asked me if I'd ever heard John Prine and he played the song Angel from Montgomery. He had learned that song from his uncle who was also very talented. It'd be later that I would hear like Bonnie Raitt's cover version of it. I think even though it was a live version of that song and I just thought it was amazing. And as I got into the, in, into the later 90s and I was really getting more into discovering the stuff that kind of inspired the alt country that I that I was such a fan of, I, I came across this album. Of course, when this album was released, he was one of the many singer-songwriters that drew all kinds of Dylan comparisons. And honestly, I never really heard it. I, I always thought that Prine was a lot more down to earth and a, and a much stronger, more relatable storyteller than, than Dylan was. This album perfectly captured the times there's a lot of topical songwriting on it, but it has a lot of staying power. And it's an album that's basically become a Bible for many songwriters that, that came after. You know, Jason Isbell once said that it was that opening line in Angel from Montgomery that I am an old woman. You know, writing from that perspective, embodying a character that really taught him that he, he didn't have to be autobiographical all the time with his songwriting. I only saw John Prine live once, and it was actually Jason Isbell opened for him. It was one of, one of the best live experiences I've had in my entire life. I was there with my friend Scott and with two of his bandmates and uh, the band that he was playing with at the time. And, and Prine, when he played Hello in there, it brought all four of us to our feet. There was something about Prine singing that song at an older age. And it just absolutely, it just moved me to tears. I would talk about it with those guys, I don't know, like a year, maybe two later. And I told them about, you know, we're just reminiscing about that concert experience and telling them, uh, you know, when he played Hello in there, like I started crying and I was like trying to, you know, hide my tears from you guys. And then they all started laughing because they did the exact same thing. So much of John Prine's music has that effect on me. His death last year hit me pretty hard. Uh, I wanted to even kind of like do a video talking about his music, but it was just in that moment and in that time, I just, I just didn't feel like I could really put all of my thoughts together, especially in the the wake of, of, of the pandemic and the fact that he was a, a victim to 
COVID, it was just, you know. And number 15, I have Revival by Gillian Welch from 1996. Gillian Welch is a, another one of those artists that Austin City Limits introduced me to. Had I not seen her on TV and been introduced to her the way that I was introduced to her, if I just heard this album playing in a room, you know, somewhere, it it would have taken a lot of convincing uh, to tell me that this music was from 1996, that it was being recorded in the 90s and put out on an album in the 90s. Many of these songs, especially the ones without electric guitar and, and drums, uh, sound pre-war. The song By the Mark, especially, that, that song, I, I actually... For years after first hearing it, I still thought that it was just a traditional gospel tune. You know, they had been written in the in the twenties, and she actually took a lot of harsh criticism at the the time of release of this album for not sounding more current. And a lot of music reviewers accused her of just aping older sounds and uh, imitating the Carter family. To me, it's the strength of her music that it sounds from a time long ago. That is not an easy thing to do. It's it's not, especially as expertly as she and David Rawlings do it. But I, I think she's an amazing songwriter. Uh, and, and and her with, with David Rawlings, they co-write a lot of things. I've seen them several times live and there is not a more authentic experience than watching the two of them and and how they interact with each other and how their voices blend. And, and it's a given, it, no matter what hall they're playing, they will step out, especially in a smaller room, but I've seen them do it in a, in a sizable theater. They will step out in front of the mic, they will pull the mic back and they will sing with, with no amplification and they fill the room. It is... <laughs> It's a sight to behold. A man of riches may claim a crown of Jews, but the king of heaven can be told from the prince of fools by I have Rumors by Fleetwood Mac from 1977. So yeah, as much of a joke as this album is to uh, record store owners and record collectors alike uh, for being overplayed and uh, probably even, you know, uh, overrated. Uh, I absolutely love this album. I never get tired of hearing it. It's some of my favorite songwriting. I think that it's one of the best recorded, mixed, mastered albums in the history of popular music. I love the tonality of the guitars, uh, the way their voices blend together when they're all singing together, the sound of the rhythm section. Mick Fleetwood's drums in particular his drum sound is the perfect drum sound. Now I've said that my parents didn't listen to a ton of like classic rock or whatever. This was probably the most classic rock-ish thing that they listened to with any, with any consistency when I was a kid. This is actually the copy that I took from the house I grew up in. This was their record. And they didn't spin records a ton when I was a kid, mostly at Christmas time. My mom would pull out her Christmas records and spin them. They didn't really spin a lot of their, their popular music, but I would still pull the albums off the shelf and I would just like look at them 
and just like this kind of evocative image as a kid. And then on the back, I mean, look at those, look at that motley crew, <laughs> those eyes. The madman growing into being an adolescent. I mean, who, I, Stevie Nicks, probably my first real crush, maybe. I don't, probably not. Maybe after Wonder Woman. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, at first as a younger man, it was Lindsey Buckingham really kind of spoke to me the most. And then as I grew older, um, you know, Stevie Nicks. And then, and now actually, I mean, Chris, Christine McVie is, is my favorite member of, of this lineup. Uh, my, my favorite member of, of Fleetwood Mac in its entire history. Some of my favorite songs by her are actually on other albums, but uh, her contribution, especially with, with Songbird, is one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard. And then her, her co-writer, Don't Stop, with, with Lindsay. I mean, I've said it like four times already. I just never get tired of this album. And, you know, for me and my wife, if we've ever been in the car from the time we started dating to, you know, to now, if we're ever in the car on a road trip and we just want to listen to some music and we can't decide, we can't come to an agreement on something, this is the album. This is the go-to album. It just, it never fails. At number 13, I have Lady Soul by Aretha Franklin from 1968. Another uh, second album by, by an artist that has appeared on this list. Again here, she's, she's taking songs by James Brown and Ray Charles. Um, even the rascals, you know, and she's making them her own. And you know, I, you'll never catch me saying that her version of People Get Ready is better than the Impressions. I mean, the Impressions song, the original, is one of my top five favorite songs of all time. But I, I will say that her cover is probably the best cover that I've ever heard. And you know, this album is just loaded with incredible players. Um, yeah, Eric Clapton guests on here, Bobby Womack, King Curtis. Uh, there's members of the Muscle Shoals Rhythm Section and the Memphis Boys. And then the vocal support by uh, her sisters. And then, and more importantly, the, the Sweet Inspirations. And then also my, my two favorite Aretha Franklin songs are on this album. Uh, Baby Sweet Baby, Since You've Been Gone, and Ain't No Way. Ain't No Way is one of the all-time great album closers. I mean, she always made every song like her own, and she always sang every song with such conviction. But on that out, on that on that particular song, on Ain't No Way, it's just absolutely gut-wrenching. It's just a perfect soul album, a perfect Southern soul album. It's the it's the sound of of soul music. In 1968, not not just my favorite soul singer, my favorite singer of all time. I mean, I, I know that's not much of a of a hot take. <laughs> At number 12, I have Nebraska by Bruce Springsteen from 1982. Talked about this in another video. Uh, the first Springsteen album that I really bought was The River, but really this was the first Bruce Springsteen album that I truly fell in love with. This was the album that I understood after hearing this, why everybody raved about Springsteen as a songwriter. Of course, it's, you know, it's just him on a guitar. It was like a four track, I guess. It's bare bones, dark, very dark. So perfect for the sad bastard here. I've said this about a lot of uh, Springsteen's music when I've talked about it in, in other videos. But more so than any other album, I mean, this collection of songs is just, it's like a mini series of cinematic stories with just immense amount of detail that, I mean, every single song plays like a movie in my head. I mean, Nebraska, Atlantic City, Mansion on a Hill, you can just see everything. Highway Patrolman, My Father's House. You can just, you can visualize the stories that are being told. And a heightened sense of drama. Closing out this masterpiece of an album. It's one of my favorite Bruce Springsteen songs. A Reason to Believe 
is it's a song that that's an account of of different sad circumstances but circumstances that in the end the characters it, it kind of sums up human perseverance and you know the willpower to carry on and it, and it provides that perfect kind of even though it's small you know it's a small gleam it's a it's a it's a gleam of hope and at number 11 i have still feel gone by uncle tupelo from 1991 so yeah we're gonna bookend this group of albums with uh, Uncle Tupelo Records. So after getting Anodyne, I also got the the debut, No Depression, which is a, considered by many uh, to be a, a groundbreaking record that came out in 1990. And this album builds on No Depression, and I really feel like this album, more than No Depression, they they've they've really found their sound. It is the perfect fusion of punk and like college radio and you know grassroots country and folk when i talked about anodyne i've talked about how uncle tupelo was was my gateway to you know the the history of country music and the history of country rock this was the album that that really introduced me to to punk you know to to certain punk bands i mean i'd listened to punk music already before this but it was you know like what was more popular at the time you know this this album uh, pointed me towards the replacements with a song like Gun. And then there's even, you know, it's called D. Boone. You know, it's a, it's a tribute to, to D. Boone of the Minutemen. That's that's how I discovered the Minutemen was, was through this album. Farrar and Tweety are just on fire at this point, you know, in, 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 in their development. They knew exactly how they wanted things to sound. Uh, and then, of course, Mike Heidorn's drumming uh, is just the, the perfect backbone to their sound. These booming drums. I mean, he plays like a punk drummer, but he also plays like a, a controlled, skilled rock and roll drummer. And he, and he also shows restraint at the right times. It's remarkable how these two 20-somethings wrote songs that are on this album that, that sound ahead of their years. Their songs like Watch Me Fall and uh, True to Life and, and Fall Down Easy that just have these clever, clever lyrics, these clever turn of phrases that, that sound like age old adages. Although I purchased this album in high school, it really, it, it soundtracked like my college years, trying to kind of put all the pieces together and, and discover your sense of purpose. Um, and then just the stresses that come with that. You know, the, the everyday stresses that everybody uh, deals with at that point in your life. And, and the alcohol that kind of <laughs> helped numb the symptoms <laughs> of all of that. Uh, and, then, and then hoping that, that that doesn't become like a bottomless pit that you fall into. I grew up in a really small town and then I went to college in a small town. And the song, Looking for a Way Out, it's one of my favorite Uncle Tupelo songs. It might be my favorite Uncle Tupelo song. Felt like that song was telling like my story. And even though I, even though I'm fine with where I've ended up, and 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 I'm and I'm happy to still, you know, be in the South, and I didn't run off, you know, and escape to the to the city, to the big city, or, or, you know, cross a border or anything <laughs> to live out the rest of my life. Um, you know, I've moved on from those feelings, but it's still funny how, how songs like that, you know, just kind of stick with you. Okay, so we only have 10 albums left, and I think it's going to be at least another two months before I get to that video. So if you guys could just sit tight uh, and be patient, um, I'll, I'll finally wrap this thing up. You know, around everything that's going on in life, I'm going to do my best to, to, to get that up soon, and uh, I want to just... Thank everybody for watching and I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, I hope you all had a great uh, Thanksgiving uh, for those that that observe it. And um, yeah, uh, we'll see you in the next one. Digital gramophone makes no sense.